So it's great to meet you all. Uh, the materials for this lecture are available at this bit.ly link, so if you want to kind of download and follow along uh, with a PDF, you know, feel free. Uh, a little bit about me, uh, by running the Who Am I command on the console. I'm Zach Feldman. I'm the co-founder and chief academic officer of the New York Code and Design Academy. Uh, that's our website, nycda.com. Uh, we're a website school that also has a website, so and we also do a lot of work internally on our website, so check it out. Uh, they work hard on it. Um, I also pitch in code sometimes. Um, I know this is kind of a bit more of an advanced track class, so some classes that are more advanced that Brian mentioned that you might find compelling if you're here for the, you know that kind of lecture uh, is our, our AngularJS uh, 102 advanced program. Uh, it meets part-time Mondays and Wednesdays from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m., and the curriculum is obviously this JavaScript framework, AngularJS, uh, you'll be able to build applications faster and then also single page applications really well. Uh, right now we're teaching Angular 1.0. Doesn't seem like 2.0 is too much adoption yet. I mean, some people are telling me they're starting to experiment with it. Uh, we'll probably make that jump at some point uh, in, in a little bit, but uh, right now it's a 1.0 based class in case you were curious. Um, we're also teaching this React.js 102 class that's being taught in Battery tonight if you want to uh, observe and check it out. Uh, it's being taught by uh, Shin, who's a really great, uh, actually an alumni of our web development intensive program, the fir very first one that we ran here. Uh, now he's gone on to teach himself a number of technologies and is even teaching here. So he's also a helicopter pilot, so just really an impressive guy. I don't know how to fly helicopters, I just know how to type, uh, so, you know, encode a little bit. So, uh, but yeah, uh, the next section of this class is launching in September, so if you're looking to kind of bone up on your advanced JavaScript frameworks, this might be the one for you. Uh, and then, of course, Voice Activated Apps 101 with Amazon Alexa. So uh, not only do we just have this one lecture uh, in which I'll try to cover a lot of ground in a very short amount of time, uh, we actually have an eight session long class that starts in August. Uh, it has a cost of $750, um, which I think is pretty reasonable for what we're offering. Once again, the only in-person training in the world on this specific topic. Uh, for now, maybe by August there'll be another one, but for now this is the only one. Uh, we're also working uh, with the curriculum with, directly with Amazon. so. Um, they're kind of assisting a little bit in reviewing it and making sure that it's all kind of uh, coherent as far as like what they've actually published and created for this platform. Uh, so the curriculum includes understanding the infrastructure. We're going to go over some of that tonight, but it's a lot more complicated than I can actually explain in 45 minutes to an hour. So uh, we'll go way more in depth in there, even talking about uh, they also have a new home device API. So we'll probably talk about that a little bit, too, which we're not going to cover tonight. Uh, and then the, the important part of the curriculum is building and publishing your first skill. So, uh, you know, Amazon is really excited about getting this up and running, and they really want a lot more skills uh, on the Alexa app for people to use. Uh, for those of you that don't know, skills are applications for the Alexa platform. So uh, that's kind of their key performance indicator for this course, uh, getting skills published. And by the end of the course, you should be in a position to publish your first skill. Um, we're also talking with them about maybe offering free devices to people that publish three or more skills that look good to Amazon. So uh, there's a possibility that you'll be compensated in devices for your skills uh, by taking this course. So it should be pretty fun. Uh, once again, uh, meets in August. If you're interested, if you have any questions, uh, you can go to this link, uh, bit.ly slash Alexa NYCDA, and that'll take you to the course description page. Uh, or you can ask me about that uh, after this uh, mini course. So you, the moment you've all been waiting for, <laughs> onto the lesson, uh, why don't we get building here? So some things to know before diving into the actual infrastructure itself about the platform. Uh, so it's not really a normal RESTful API. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever worked with a RESTful API. All right, we've got some RESTful API people in here. Uh, what I mean is, you know, it's not just as simple as, uh, you know, getting a request from an Alexa device and then responding to it. It actually is a bit more complicated than that. There's some setup requ required, um, and it actually goes beyond you know, simple setup, like creating an account with Amazon and getting an API key. Like, there's a lot more involved, and, and we'll go over what I mean by that. Um, and that's all done on the Amazon Developer Console. So on developer.amazon, or developers.amazon.com, uh, the same kind of, the same place that you would uh, submit applications to their other application stores, there's a special area just for Alexa, um, and it is open to the public, and anyone can kind of sign up and get information on that. So... Uh, by the way, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Just raise your hand, uh, and I'll be happy to get to you. So there's some limitations of the platform itself. Uh, there's no extended media playback right now. Uh, what I mean by that is for you know custom applications that you're building. So you can't build the next Napster on Alexa. You can't just kind of build like a music sharing service or something. Uh, I believe the reason they're doing that is because of licensing limitations and like liability on their side if someone puts up something that's pirated or something like that. 
Um, you can play clips though. There's a 90 second limit. Uh, the reason, main reason that Amazon is doing this is so that brands can, you know, have kind of a branded voice experience rather than just having the default um, Alexa response, uh, which sounds kind of like this. Where is the International Space Station? ISS is a space station. So, I mean, it sounds like a robot, right? So, uh, you know, one potential use of this might be, let's say you're like progressive and you want Flo to be the one answering all of your Alexa requests. You could record, you know, clips of her saying, oh, progressive is great. I don't know. Um, and then like it comes out like that, except, you know, what would probably be funnier would be me pretending to be Flo. So, uh, but anyway, you have a 90 second limit on that. So it's really just meant for like, you know, custom voice experiences. Uh, there's no prompting the user out of the blue. Uh, I think you and I can all agree that it'd be a little disturbing if your Alexa device just started speaking to you. You know, maybe this is the dystopian future we're headed towards. Like, instead of pop-ups, it's just like, hey, you want to buy a new car today? I've got great financing offers for you. Say yes if you'd like to proceed. Like, I don't think any user buys this device going into it being like, that's what I want to happen, right? So you can't just kind of say back to it, oh, can you prompt the user right now? And that is a limitation. Uh, and I think a lot of people are getting around that by, you know, implementing mobile uh, notifications or maybe implementing notifications on a website or through an email. Uh, you know, I think there's other ways to get in touch with a user besides kind of prompting them randomly. Uh, and there's lots of other caveats and limitations that we'll kind of figure out as we go along. Uh, for instance, like the length of how long a session can be and how many, how much back and forth there can be between the user uh, and the application. So, all right, so the components of an Alexa skill uh, you've got the skill information, so that's just kind of the boilerplate meta information, like the title, etc. Uh, the interaction model, and that's really the meat and potatoes, so to speak. That's where that's what I, where I was saying when I was saying it's not so easy to kind of just start with this. You can't just start sending requests back and forth. That's defining the interaction model. So you have to kind of do that before you begin uh, the request and response, and and kind of seeing how that conversation happens. Um, that includes uh, setting up an intent schema. Intents are made of slots, uh, custom slot types if you want to have them, uh, and then also sample utterances. So that means something that your user might say to the application. I'll go over in a lot more detail what all these things mean in a moment, but that's a basic boilerplate. Uh, you also need to do some configuration. So, uh, you know, every application has an endpoint. So when you make a request to an application, it'll send a request to a URL somewhere, right? Just like any other kind of API integration. Uh, and that's an endpoint on your side for the application that's going to respond to the request. So you have to decide if you want to just have a HTTPS endpoint uh, that's any URL. You know, you could host it on Heroku, you could host it on your own local server, whatever you want. Uh, or if you want to use an AWS Lambda. Um, I'll go into a little bit more about Lambda later on, but I'm actually using it in my sample application uh, just for a proxy to make it easier to test. So. Um, so yeah, you do that uh, endpoint. Oh, and then endpoint configuration, meaning uh, you're going to have to actually build an application to deal with these requests, right? So it's not enough to just define how it should work. You also have to build an application that once you know that request is sent to it, it processes it, sends back something to Alexa so that Alexa uh, knows what to do. Uh, are there any questions so far? Uh, like I said, I know this might seem it's a lot to take in at once, but I'm going to kind of go over this in more detail in a moment. So anybody have anything that's on their mind? No? Do you have any questions? <laughs> hmm. I can't find the answer to the question I heard. Whoa. That's really bad. <laughs> All right. Neither can I. Stop. Um, by the way, in case anyone was wondering, uh, I do have a bunch of Amazon Echoes at home. I have one in every room of my apartment, which my girlfriend loves. But um, the point being, uh, you know, there's many different Alexa devices now. What Amazon has now is something called Alexa Voice Services, and it allows you to actually uh, basically integrate Alexa into any device. So I think Chrysler announced today that they're going to have it in their cars, which should be pretty cool. Uh, there's already a company that's put out a shower radio with Alexa in it, so any hardware device you build can now have Alexa on it. Uh, as far as what's being offered officially by Amazon, they have the Amazon Echo, which is the first device uh, that came out, kind of like the big cylindrical speaker. They also have the Amazon Dot, which is like that, except they took out the speaker. So it's, a, it's like a hockey puck, and you can connect that to any audio output. So if you have a receiver in your house or some other you know, audio thing you want to use with it, you can connect it. Uh, it also has Bluetooth input and output, so uh, you, or maybe not input, I'm sorry, uh, Bluetooth output. So you can you know, hook that up to a Bluetooth speaker if it's louder. You know, I have that set up in my room. Uh, and then this is the Amazon Tap, and this is a mobile Bluetooth speaker version of uh, Amazon Alexa. 
of course, it has to be paired to Wi-Fi in order to work. So you know, maybe you have a hotspot on your phone or some other way to get it going on a, in a mobile way, but it doesn't have a built-in SIM card or anything. So if it's not connected to a Wi-Fi network, you can really just use it as a glorified Bluetooth speaker. But those are kind of the official uh, Alexa platform options. Uh, and for the class we're doing, uh, I mentioned earlier, Amazon sent us 30 of these. Uh, they're hidden somewhere in this office. Don't try to find them. But um, when we do that class, everyone in the class will have a device at their desk ready to test with at all times. Uh, they'll also be obviously testing through their official portal where you don't have to say it every single time. Let me tell you, you get a uh, sore throat if you try to test your application manually every single time just from saying the same thing over and over again. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain a little bit better about ways to test uh, later on. Um, all right, so let's jump into it. Uh, the type of skill information you need about your skill. Uh, there's an application ID, and this is granted and generated by Amazon, and that's just kind of a long UUID type string that identifies your application. Uh, the skill type, uh, we're going to be talking mostly about custom interaction model skills. There's also a smart home skill API. Uh, right now, it's outside of the scope of the course we're offering. I may, or I may decide to cover it you know, to some degree, depending on how big it gets between now and then, but right now, I think most of the partners are like Nest and uh, one or two other home automation companies. So we'll see how many more people get into it and how much pickup it gets. Um, but custom interaction model skills are kind of like the, the basic skill. As, as They don't really sound very basic, but they are. Uh, there's also the name of the application that's just displayed in the Alexa app. So if you're in uh, the Alexa app on your phone and you're looking at different skills and the skills, uh, it's not really a marketplace, but kind of the list of skills, that'll be the name that comes up. Uh, and the invocation name. So that would be the name that a user says to start your application. Uh, there's, a, there's many different ways to invoke an application, actually, but uh, it does have to be invoked before you can use it, uh, unless you're Amazon and you have the native uh, functionality kind of thing. So Amazon has the power to build in stuff like, Alexa, what's the weather in this location, right? But if I were a developer, a third-party developer, uh, building a weather application, I might have to say, Alexa, ask Zach Weather what the weather is in this location, or open Zach Weather. You know, there's a few different invocation commands that you can give, uh, and then you have to have an invocation name for the application. So the invocation name doesn't have to be the same name as the actual name of the application, but instead it should probably be something that's easy for people to say, you know, or easy for them to remember because they're going to be saying it whenever they open up your app. So, uh, so the interaction model, let's talk about how that works. Uh, and by the way, let me just leave the slideshow for a second and show you this in the actual Amazon developer portal. So we have the portal open right now. Uh, I have a, so I actually built this application before the official Uber integration came out that now exists as part of this. So uh, I'm sorry for a repeat, but this is my own version of the Uber application. Um, so there's an application ID, a skill type, which I've said is a custom interaction model skill, uh, the name of the app, which I called Get an Uber, and then the invocation name, which is Uber. So if any of you have been trying to make your own Uber invocation name, sorry that I took that from you. It's like domain names. You know, they get taken. Uh, I'm pretty sure that no two apps can have the same invocation name. So there's probably going to be a little bit of a land rush as far as grabbing the invocation name. So that's the skill information. Um, here's the interaction model. And I'm about to discuss uh, what all of these things are and how they work. So uh, we start with slots. Slots are kind of similar to variables. Uh, and basically, it's just a way for your users to give input to your application. Uh, every time your user makes a request, uh, the value of this slot might change. So you just define the name of the slot, just like you define the name of a variable. And then just like in any other program, that can change based on the user's request. Some examples of a slot, house number, street name, astrological sign, pizza topping preference one, <laughs> you know, these are the things that are going to be inside of the utterance, right? The utterance is how the user requests your application. So Alexa, open Uber, uh, get me a cab to Union Square. Union Square uh, might be the uh, landmark. That's one example of what a slot could be, right? So a slot's just kind of a, the name for a variable that's going to uh, store your user input. Uh, there's also slot types. Every slot must have a type. Uh, there is an option to define custom slot types, so if you're looking at them and thinking none of these really work for my use case, you can make your own. Um, and that's really just kind of giving the slot type a name and then giving it a bunch of examples. Um, so I'll go over that in a second. Uh, but you can also use the built-in slot types, and they actually have some pretty useful ones so far, and I imagine they'll get more useful as time goes on. Uh, kind of the advantage of using these built-in slot types is that uh, Amazon has kind of tested different types of inputs to them. So some of the examples are, you know, date, duration, four-digit number, 
any kind of number, a time, a U.S. city, uh, common U.S. first names, U.S. states. Uh, and basically what this means is that, you know, Amazon has kind of tested a bunch of different uh, configurations of how these things might be said and can pretty easily parse out when they're being said in your application. Uh, and that's really useful for different applications because uh, if you're saying uh, a date in like, there's like 12 different ways you can say a date, right? Like June 15th, 1990 or 6 15 1990, right? So it's good that Amazon has done that work for you. You don't have to do it on your application side. Um, for the things that they haven't done for you, you can just use a custom slot type and define your own slot. Uh, there's also Amazon.literal, uh, which is really just kind of like a placeholder uh, for basically the kind of functionality that custom slot types offer. Um, it's really just like a holdover from the first version of the Area API uh, and the first version of uh, AVS, Alexa Voice Services. Uh, and so deprecation is coming, just like winter is coming. So uh, don't use this in your application unless you're ready to deprecate it when the time comes, which could be at any moment, because this, this changes pretty often. I mean, it's pretty new. So um, Intents. So one level above the slots are intents, and that's a way to codify the user's request into actionable data. Uh, so each intent has zero to many slots, and each slot has a type. Uh, so an intent doesn't have to have a slot. Uh, maybe your user just says something to the application, like, you know, uh, open this application, and that would be an open intent, right? So an intent is just kind of the codifying the user wanting to do a specific thing, right? Um, each slot in your intent will be combined into a JSON request uh, once the request gets made from the user, uh, and then that JSON request gets fed back to your application when the intent is used. So, uh, like I said, you have to define all this stuff before you start testing your application, you would define what your intent types are uh, and what the slots inside of that intent type inside of uh, those intent types are, uh, and then when your user makes a request to their application, um, your application will get a JSON blob back that has, "Hey, it's this type of intent. Here's what the slot values are." So maybe it's a uh, you know Uber request intent, and inside of that Uber request intent, there's a landmark slot type or you know a, a house number and city. Uh, slot type and those will get returned in a JSON hash to your application so that you can work with them and, and do stuff with them. Uh, uh, here's an intent example. So an intent known as get address intent might include a house number, street name, city, uh, and in my, the case of my Uber application it also has a landmark slot because sometimes you just say where you want to go uh, using one word or phrase like Union Square or something like that. Um, so when a user interacts with your application, uh, one way they can invoke it would be to say, ask. So Alexa, ask Taxi on Demand to get me a cab to Union Square. Uh, or Alexa, open Taxi on Demand, then get me a cab to Union Square. Or Alexa, open Domino's. So uh, it doesn't have to, the launch request intent, which is what this is called, doesn't have to necessarily have data in it. It could just be open this application and then your application responds to something. Uh, or it can have data in it, and that's really nice if you want to have a nice short uh, interaction, right? Rather than one that's kind of protracted over several back and forths. Um, and I think short is probably better uh, in this world. If you can educate your users enough to make that request the first time, uh, it'll make it a lot easier for you when you're developing your application. So, uh, all right, so. Now that we know what it, slots are and intents are, first of all, are there any questions? Yes? So, are you going to define exactly what the user says, or because before you said that they can invoke like the scale application in all different ways? Mm -hmm. So, if they, for example, just say, start tax on demand, and then they mm -hmm. don't say the rest of it, can you build in like multiple options as a fail safe? Yeah, you definitely can. So your application can definitely have like a bunch of logic that says if they don't say anything, then say back to them, what would you like, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is that it's a little scary when I say like, oh, you have to define exactly what the user says. But what's really interesting is that Amazon kind of guesses to some degree. So if it sounds like what you've defined, then it will still get attributed the correct way. Okay. That has blown my mind so far, but yeah. like... You know, they just need enough, I'm pretty sure they're using some kind of crazy machine learning algorithm, but like, they just need enough examples to get a general idea of what your user means. And that's really where the magic is, if you ask me. So, um, any other questions uh, for now? No. All right, I'm glad you're all getting this completely, and your first skill will be out by the end of tonight. Um, so, uh, now that we know about intents and slots, uh, that's what your intent schema is comprised of, is... It could be many different intents, uh, and then each of those intents kind of have slots as a sub uh, group underneath them. 
so let's take a look at a sample intent schema. I've removed some parts because it's really hard to see if I have all of it. It looks like this, and nobody can see that. So uh, here's what it looks like generally. Um, it's a JSON, uh, kind of like a JSON hash, JSON data structure. So uh, intent uh, is kind of like the top level uh, in curly braces. And then uh, there's a slot uh, key. And the value for that is an array with the different slots uh, for that specific intent. So uh, intents is really an array of different intents, right? And then uh, the first uh, slot in that array is this one, uh, but you could put multiple slots uh, in an intent. So, um, so, so an entire intent is basically composed of a number of slots, right? And then the name of the intent, like get address intent, right? So the get address intent in this example includes a house number, which is an Amazon number type because, you know, 13 uh, Wallaby Way or whatever it is, right? That's just a simple number. Uh, and then the street name, Wallaby Way. Uh, and that's a special custom type that I defined. And I'll get back to custom types in a moment and explain that in more detail. Um, but that's how slots work. And then, like I said, you have to give the intent a name. Uh, all the kind of official Amazon documentation just uses like a kind of a form of camel case uh, for that. And so I've kind of just copied them. Uh, but I'm sure you could kind of name this whatever you'd like if you wanted to. Uh, actually, I'm not sure, but you could try. Um, so that's an intent schema, and then, like I said, this is an actual full intent schema for one of my applications. Uh, I know it's a uh, probably very hard to see, but if you look at the bit.ly link, then you could get a better idea. And uh, this is like, let's see here. Yeah, so this is like a, an intent, and then this is also an intent. So uh, get confirmation intent, which is just, do you want a cab, yes or no? Right, and then, so that's only one slot, and then the get address intent. Um, you'll notice that I can actually have kind of two separate types of opening requests. So kind of going back to your question, maybe the user opens and starts with a you know street number, street name, city, uh, state kind of thing. Maybe they open and they just give me a landmark, right? So I can actually have both of those types of things defined in the same slots, and then later on when I get to my sample utterances, I would clarify to the um, to AVS that. Um, that I'm using one or the other. So I have one with a landmark and then one with all the other ones in it as a sample utterance. Uh, once again, I'll get, I'll get back to sample utterances in a second and give you uh, some examples there. Um, any questions at this juncture? Yeah. What the Amazon... Um, not really. Like the way it works is that you send requests through SSL, which is a secure standard already, uh, to Amazon servers, and then they send stuff back to you. So it's kind of like behind that wall, like behind their, their you know, endpoints and servers. And this, I mean, as far as I know, there's no way to get into that area. And I don't think they'd really want you to, right? So um, they do, I believe, in the developer portal, they post some of the source code behind it, but I don't think they post all of it for obvious reasons. So as we know, Google, lots of other companies are trying to get into this game, and I'm sure that they've put, invested a lot of money in research. Um, they do have like over 1,300 employees, I think, in this division already. So huge investment. Um, any other questions for now? Bueller? No? OK. Uh, so some custom slot type information. Um, these just require a type and some sample values for what that custom, custom slot type is going to have. Uh, and the val sample values won't necessarily encompass everything the user might say, like I said, but they should give the um, Alexa system, you know, some degree of certainty about what the user is saying. Uh, so here's some examples of that. You could have a landmark, and some of the examples for that uh, specific ex example are Union Square, Times Square, Central Park. Uh, my Uber application is very, very uh, New York focused because that's where I'm testing it. Uh, I'm sure that the official one has a lot more landmarks in it, or at least more examples of what a landmark could look like. Um, you've also got streets, so you'll notice that I've got a few different examples here. Uh, one of them is three, uh, you know, three words long, a few of them are two words long, um, that kind of thing. But this gives Alexa enough of an idea of what a street name might look like uh, in New York to kind of infer what other street names might be like. And it's not always perfect every single time, but it's doing a decent job so far of guessing. Um, I also defined a yes-no slot type uh, with just yes and no. Uh, you would think this is kind of a, a default slot type already, but uh, either it wasn't or it wasn't working for my uses, so I defined my own. Uh, but as you can see, a custom slot type is really just the name of what the slot should be called and then uh, some examples of what the values could be. So, And then you would assign that custom slot type 
um, to a specific uh, slot and then intent. So the last step in setting up your interaction model before you start actually testing your application uh, is setting up sample utterances. So an utterance is something that uh, a phrase that somebody says basically. Um, and these are prefixed with an intent name, then a sample phrase with slots denoted with curly braces. So a little bit of a special syntax. Uh, there's always going to be an intent here to start it off. So get address intent, get confirmation intent, uh, and then a sample utterance of what the user might say. Uh, the more of these that you provide, the more accurate your application is going to be. Uh, since I was just kind of testing things out, this is all that I have for my application, and so that's kind of what works. I just have to say, get me a cab to Landmark, and then it should work. Um, but you can obviously get a lot more complicated and uh, have kind of as many different slots as you want inside of your sample utterances. And you can also kind of mix and match them. So you'll notice that I have a Landmark slot in here, and then a House Number, Street, and City slot in here. Uh, and they're actually part of the same intent, right? So you can have different slots, uh, same intent, and that means your user can address your application in many different ways. Uh, any questions at this point? Yes. I just like to only understand. As far as I know, it does. Like, is there any place that you define the settings? Donde esta la biblioteca? I wasn't able to understand the question. Apparently not. So. I think it's just within the English language and common phrases. I mean, really difficult words like, you know, define onomatopoeia, you know, like there's words that it gets tripped up on. Um, I have noticed that it gets a lot, it gets better over time. I think that they're just continually working on improving it. And I'm sure that like language support is something that's going to come soon, uh, considering Amazon is international. I don't really know, but um, that will complicate the process a lot. I mean, I'm imagining kind of like configuration files with like different uh, internationalization and that kind of thing. A whole new cottage industry of people who are like employed just to like translate Alexa applications just like we have for Rails applications and the internationalization. Um, but right now, English only. Yeah. So sorry everyone else. Uh, when you define the custom types and you give it the sample uh, things, uh -huh. is it evaluating them just on formatting or is it like qualitative as well? Uh, I think it's just on formatting, uh, basically on your sample utterances. So get me a cab to blank, you know, get me a cab to number blank on blank in blank, right? Nice. Um, but it'll do some inference. So maybe you add an extra word or, you know, say something a little bit different or adhere something a little bit different. Uh, there's still a good chance that it will get you the correct information, you know. So, uh, so obviously, you know, kind of the final component of this is once you've set up all those, all those things and... And to give you an idea of what those look like actually in the developer console, uh, here we are in the developer console. Uh, we set up our skill information. We have the interaction model tab right here, which includes the intent schema. So, you know, as you can see, kind of all sketched out. Uh, the custom slot types that I've added, and you can add them pretty easily right here. Uh, and then also the sample utterances, which are right here. And they have a lot of good documentation and links to it. So if you're confused about something, <laughs> click the link. It should make a lot more sense. Bless you, sir. Um, cool. So that's the setup of the application, the config. Uh, and when the end user requests your application, so when they say, Alexa, open Uber, or Alexa, ask you to turn on the living room lights, uh, a request gets sent from Amazon uh, via HTTPS with a JSON hash to an endpoint that you define. Uh, so, uh, you know, you're never really going to get uh, through the API, like, the recording of what the user is saying. You can get that through the history tab on your Amazon Alexa app, but you know, people that are worried about like security and like kind of hearing what people are saying and all of that, like what you get back is really just like a distillation of what they said and or maybe a transliteration of it. You, you don't really get back people's voices. You know, I think people would find that kind of creepy, so um, it's not something that's built in. Um, but yeah, when, when the user asks, uh, a request gets sent to your application. So let me actually give you an example of that happening in real life. And then I'll explain how that example works. Open Uber. Where would you like to go? Get me a cab to Union Square. Just to confirm, you'd like a cab right now to Union Square, New York, New York, 10003, USA, correct? Yes.
Now I need to cancel it because. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, oh crap. He already he already confirmed. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Unless anyone needs a ride anywhere on me, you know. Um, I don't like to test the Uber API, the request API, with fake requests because it's actually much harder to see them go through. So I just prefer to like keep it all live. Um, it's opening. It's opening. It's opening. I still haven't been banned, by the way. I've, I've requested rides like five times and canceled all of them. And like, okay, sorry, Ali and the Toyota Sienna. My bad. Okay, canceling. Great. Uh, so that you know, so as you can see, like Amazon is sending a request to my application. Uh, and let me give you a better idea, too, of what the request response uh, lifecycle, in this case, looks like. Uh, what I've done, and I'll show you more code uh, later on, but uh, where am I at here? Yeah, there we go. So what I've done is actually built a logging feature into my application so that it's very easy for me to see what that request response looks like. And it's a lot easier to see, actually, in the Finder with Preview. So we'll just go there really quick. Uh, logs. Oh, not that. No logs. Here we go. So here's the request. Um, and you can see at the top I put the request origin so it's easy for you to tell where it's coming from. Uh, that's the requ first request that Amazon sends to me and it's called a launch request. Uh, and it just gives me a timestamp, it gives me a request ID. Um, it also gives me a session ID so that for this specific interaction there's a session set up. Um, part of my code is setting up sessions for, for this kind of thing in Sinatra, and I'll show you some of that later. Um, so I respond and I say, where, I say to say to the user, where would you like to go? Right? Uh, and then it actually says that back to me, which is pretty cool. Um, and then the next thing is me saying, get me a cab to Union Square. Right? Uh, and here's that JSON that I was talking about. Right? So here's the request, the intent, uh, the name of the intent get address intent, the slots, and you'll notice that street name, house number, and city are blank, but landmark is filled out with Union Square, which is what I just said. So that's pretty cool. It heard me very well. Uh, I was standing right next to it, but still kind of cool. Um, so uh, so I get that to my application from Alexa slash Amazon. Uh, my application responds and says, just to confirm, you'd like, an app, you'd like a cab right now to Union Square in New York, New York, correct? Um, by the way, should end session is false. If you set that to true, then your session is over and, you know, Alexa stops talking to you. Um, and then I get the confirmation intent, which says, yes, I would like that cab. Uh, and then my app should reply and say, um, hailing your cab now, check the Uber app for arrival information or to cancel your trip. So that's what the JSON kind of flying back and forth across the waves looks like. And it's pretty amazing to me how fast it happens. Um, I'm on like US East right now, but uh, as far as server location. But um, so that's kind of how the communication works between uh, the two applications. Uh, and as far as what endpoints can be, meaning like where these requests get sent, as far as endpoints, uh, they can be AWS Lambda functions, which are identified by ARNs, which are Amazon resource names, and those are just kind of like these long text-based links. Uh, or they can be HTTPS URLs. Uh, this is kind of where it's, it gets a little tough, which is that you know, any request that gets sent from an actual device does have to go to an endpoint that has uh, an SSL certificate. Um, so, you know, if you're kind of trying to set things up, uh, like on Heroku or some other, you know, application host, you have to have an SSL certificate on that uh, host. Uh, the way that I've gotten around that, uh, I will show you once I get to the code, but uh, it suffice it to say that it's a little bit hard to set up an SSL certificate on your development machine. Um, it's possible, it's just difficult, so I found a bit of a workaround. Um, but these are the two different types of endpoints that you can have for your application. As far as testing your application, it can be done directly in any of your account's linked Alexa devices. So uh, what's kind of cool to me is that when I build a new application, uh, I can just kind of go home and be like, oh, I'm just like in, in my bedroom. I've got an Alexa here. Let me just ask it, you know, see how the application works using this device, you know. Uh, as soon as your, uh, your app is kind of up for testing and, and like set up... Uh, as soon as your app is set up through your developer account, you can pretty much access it from any of your Alexa devices. So I enjoy that a lot. Uh, there's also a service simulator in the Amazon developer portal. That looks kind of like this. Uh, test. And you can just type in an utterance, meaning what a user could say. So kind of like this. I'm not going to ask it because it just gets annoying. I have to cancel it again. But uh, basically, you would just see uh, the request sent out. 
uh, and then the response that we get back uh, from the application. So uh, you could also kind of listen. There's a voice simulator to hear how the device would speak or respond. So if you have your headphones plugged into your computer or whatever, you can you know hear what Alexa would, would sound like saying your response. So um, there's also a new uh, website called echosim.io. I'll just really quickly show you that one. But it's exactly what it sounds like. It's an Amazon Echo simulator. Uh, that is taking a long time to load. So, oh, never mind. What's the weather? What's the weather? Well, I guess it only works okay. But it looks really cool, right? No. Uh, I've seen it work well, and uh, whoever uh, coded it did a great job. I think it's really a great thing. So... Uh, so if you're looking to test in a more like realistic environment, but without dropping a few hundred dollars or you know a seventy or eighty dollars on one of these, then you can kind of do that as well. Um, so before your skill is published to the Alexa application, you just have to fill out some information for Amazon to approve. Uh, so some of that is like legal and compliance stuff, like I'm okay with my skill being listed here and like agree to these agreements and that kind of thing. Um, and then some of it is just you know housekeeping kind of meta information for the market or sorry not market. Um, the uh, skill section in the application. Uh, Amazon is gonna review that information, they're gonna test your skill, and then approve or reject your skill for the Alexa app. So kind of similar to the way that Apple does things on the, uh, on the iOS marketplace, like they just kind of have control over that, and who gets in, who gets out. Um, I, don't, I haven't um, gone through that final process yet of submitting and getting an application cleared. I've just created a lot of test applications, uh, but I will be doing that before the class starts, and that'll be uh, the focus of the kind of the seventh, end of the seventh, and into the eighth class of, you know, what are the caveats of like getting something published? Like, what does that process look like? Um, the whole process is actually fairly new, like getting things actually published. So I'm, I'm going to submit some stuff and find out more about it. Um, but that would be kind of generally how things get published uh, there. So. Uh, so I'm going to go into some code, but before I do, uh, are there any questions on anything I've gone over so far? Uh, sure. Yeah, there's a there's now a requests API on Uber, uh, which lets you actually you know request rides. So I'll show you the code once I go into it. So. Uh, yeah, similar to that. So they have it's like a RESTful API, and you just have to be authenticated with it, and then uh, you can send ride requests on behalf of a user. So that's pretty cool. Actually, Uber added a new API last week where it's for their messenger service. So you could move one physical thing to anywhere else physically uh, within like a city, which is really cool to me that you could just, you know, create a service to send people goldfish or something. I don't know, <laughs> but it's possible now if you want to do it. So uh, other questions? How good is it that filtering out background noise? So like basically the same command works in absolute silence versus something that's like real time compatibility? It's not awesome at it. Uh, it's OK at it. and what I think the it's not so good at that, but what's surprising to me is how good it works really far away, especially the Amazon Tap and or sorry Amazon Dot and Amazon Echo. Uh, they specifically have seven microphones built into them. I'm not 100% on this one um, having that or not. I don't think it, it doesn't according to this gentleman. Um, but the thing about the Echo is that I'm sitting like 20 or 25 feet away from it and say Alexa, get me this, and it hears me perfectly and. That was what shocked me so much when I first got it because I tried, you know, Siri and I tried like Google Now and all of that, but I always had to be really close to my phone. But to be able to just sit there and say something to, to, to a device that's 25 feet away and then have it understand you perfectly was just crazy to me. So that's, I think, the killer feature. But I've tried it at parties and stuff and I have to like get up really close to it and be like, Alexa, turn off this crappy song, you know. Um, so, so yeah, I think that... Uh, it actually, you know, it's really about the proximity to me that's interesting. And I think the background noise they'll work on, but I think also that realistically when people use this device, there's not going to be that much background noise because it's also annoying from a user perspective because you can't hear the device, right? So um, until we all have implants in our, you know, right back here and we can kind of, yeah, we're, we're getting there. It'll have to take a few years, but um, okay, great. So I'll dive into some code. And like I said, feel free to interrupt me at any point and uh, with questions. Um, all right, so... We're using Ruby. I really like Ruby. Uh, I've been a Rails developer for a number of years and also built a lot of Sinatra applications. Um, and Sinatra is great. It's, it's very similar to Express. Uh, question. Uh, it can pinpoint to some degree. Like, 
you like I'll sometimes I've given a request and there's like three or four friends and we're like you know sitting around a table and like I'll be over here and I'll be like Alexa turn off this song and it'll understand um, but it takes a little longer like it's kind of parsing it out um, so yeah to some degree but it's not like voice fingerprinting where it knows that it's you saying it uh, yeah although you can do training for it so you can kind of utter a bunch of phrases like 20 of them and then it'll get know your voice better and so I think that that means that if you're saying something versus other people having a conversation it'll pick it out like kind of but yeah uh, okay so like I was saying uh, Ruby really great I like it uh, as a language uh, just really easy for me to iterate over things and make them happen and then Sinatra is a web application framework uh, but it's much more stripped down so if you've used Rails before uh, it's kind of like that except just a lot simpler uh, and it's similar to Express so you know you kind of define uh, routes like when a user makes a post request to this endpoint do this thing right uh, and then you define the requests or what happens in that request uh, within this body so uh, to caution you all uh, it's not the cleanest code in the world uh, there is there's like a gem or two out there and a gem is a library for Ruby that uh, kind of tries to deal with these things but I don't think anything really is comprehensive yet uh, I might be working on one myself actually with an associate of mine out west uh, who's interested in this kind of thing too um, but for right now it's really just kind of like parsing raw JSON requests and sending back you know JSON back to the application uh, it's not in super pretty wrapper just yet so bear with me here um, but the way this is working right now is that uh, so from the beginning uh, I ask it to open uber right uh, I have it set up with an AWS lambda uh, my lambda isn't actually my application it's actually just a proxy that forwards requests to and from my application so uh, it's a uh, it's kind of like a node runtime based application uh, and all it really does is you give it some handlers uh, in this case that would be like my echo application app ID uh, and then the IP address where I am right now which is our Verizon router right over there uh, and then forwards the command to me so this is not really how you're supposed to do it with a production application and uh, you know like let's see here so skill information or configuration yeah. So right now I'm using a Lambda ARN, or, or a Lambda, an AWS Lambda, and this is what the URL to that looks like internally to Amazon. Uh, so as far as, you know, uh, Alexa and like Amazon voice services are concerned, they think I'm just sending requests to and from this Lambda and then getting a response and that's the end of it. But what's really happening is that I'm forwarding these requests on uh, locally so that I can process them and test them. Uh, this is because the first time I tried doing this, I was just pushing to Heroku or AWS constantly over and over again, and it was getting incredibly annoying to test changes. So uh, this allows me to just forward things uh, to my local machine. Uh, and by the way, I didn't write this code. Somebody on the web did, and I took it from a forum. So I wanted to give that person credit. I don't know their name, but if you're out there, person, thank you. You helped me and saved me a lot of time. Um, so I get the requests from here. It gets sent to the Lambda. And then that gets sent to my application for processing. And then I return something, it gets sent back through the Lambda, and then back to here to Amazon Voice Services. Um, so the code itself, uh, we start off and create a, a variable called Alexa request. And that's just taking in uh, the actual JSON that Alexa is sending to me, that Amazon is sending to me. So request.body.read will just get me whatever the request's body is. Uh, and I can show you the logs once again, just so that's really clear. So that's what that looks like. This JSON hash is what gets sent back first. And I'll make this a little bigger. Uh, and then I have a method called start Alexa session. Uh, and that's kind of taken from the Alexa support file. Uh, so what I did was I created a constant called Alexa sessions. And that is basically just an array full of different Alexa sessions that might happen in the lifetime of my, of my application. Uh, definitely not a perfect solution. I mean, like, if you end up running a production application with this, you might just you know have your memory kind of overwhelmed with the amount of sessions that might happen. Uh, but for now, it's a decent session storage solution. And uh, I mean, there's nothing really built into Sinatra to handle this type of use case. Um, so I mean, I've tried the kind of using the default session hash, and it didn't work so well. Um, so this basically just kind of defines a way to start a session and add it to the session's hash. Uh, and then when you get back uh, the request, you can get the session that you currently were operating from. Uh, and the session is just a way for me to store data about the specific uh, thing that's happening right now. So the interaction you saw before where I said, uh, Alexa, get, get me an Uber, right? And then the back and forth of that, that whole discrete unit is a session, right? 
Uh, so you might be in your apartment calling my application too, right? And that's another session. So I have to be able to keep track of all of these sessions of my application. Um, so, okay, so we have the Alexa request, which isn't a variable. We've started our Alexa session, uh, and then the session variable is going to be equal to that specific session. So maybe not the most elegant way to do it, but it's how we got started. Um, I'm also uh, creating some log files. So I have a location for that, which is in the logs folder. Uh, and each log file has the specific date and time of the request, and then also the Amazon uh, request ID, so that it's very easy to see like where all these requests came from and for debugging purposes, log them. Um, and also creates a new directory um, if there is no uh, log file for this specific session. Uh, there's an add log file method. Uh, what that does is it just adds a new file to this folder. Right? So every time a request or response comes in, I run that method and log it so that I can see what the interaction looked like. Uh, and then we get into the actual meat of it. So uh, we're checking to see what type of request comes in. Uh, if it's a launch request, then the response text should be equal to where would you like to go? And we're not going to end the session. End session is going to be false. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other logic here for all the other requests that we're making. And then towards the end of it, we actually build the response. So uh, for that, I have an Alexa response module. Um, where did I put that? Alexa response. Uh, let's see here. Response. Yes, so this is just an object I built uh, to just very easily build a response uh, to the API. So like, for instance, I shouldn't have to put in the version of uh, Alexa API that I'm using every single time. So this just helps me build the response in a lot easier of a way. Um, and I just give it uh, what to say back. So that could be kind of anything I want. Uh, let's actually try that out. Uh, what, what would you all like to hear this device say to you? Anybody? <laughs> no? All right. How about the aliens have arrived? So with luck, this should be what gets said back to us right now, just because I, you know, rather than using the variable, just overrode it completely. Open Uber. The aliens have arrived. You know, stop. Stop the aliens. The aliens have arrived. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> we might end up in a sticky situation there. Uh, but you can make it say whatever you want, really. Uh, and then there's also cards. So cards are in the Alexa application, um, Alexa dot, or echo.amazon.com, is it now Alexa, let's see. Uh, and this is the same, you know, it's a web app that gets used on desktop, it gets used on all the actual official applications, it's all kind of the same app. Um, but you'll see that this is what's called a card, and a card is kind of like a record for the user of the last interaction they've had, uh, and it can have a title and a description. Um, I put Philly RB as awesome because I gave a similar talk at Philly RB, so that's why there's this uh, reference in case you were curious. Um, but your card could say anything. Um, some people have been using them for user authentication too, like you know, click here to finish your sign-up process. Um, Amazon is starting to implement more native functionality in that area because obviously authenticating with a user is a pretty important need of an application. Um, but you could use these cards for many different things. So, uh, and then should end session is just whether or not we want the session to be over or not. Um, so that response gets built. Uh, I add a log file with what the response is. Um, and then I also have a counter in the session that counts the number of interactions that have happened so far, just because it helps for debugging purposes. Uh, and then I send back the response to Amazon. So this is a Sinatra application that has only one endpoint, which is slash command, and that just takes in uh, the command from Amazon. And then lots of different logical trees based on the type of request, uh, based on the type of intent, as well, uh, and then based on you know the session basically being over and you know hailing uh, the Uber. So someone was asking before about how we hail the Uber. Well, here's how it works. Um, so in order to do this, we actually have to have a uh, server or a uh, what is it a bearer token. Uh, it's either server or bearer where you actually have to authenticate with Uber in order to get this token. Uh, as a user, so not as a developer, but more as like the person that it, whose Uber account is going to be used to do this, right? Um, so the Uber API gem has like an, a sample application where you can just do this really easily. So and it only expires every thirty days. So whenever I'm testing this application, I'll just open up that sample application, get myself a, a user token on my account's behalf, 
and then use that for all of these sample requests. Uh, and there's a pretty good Ruby gem for this, um, although it didn't have request support, so I have to add that in. Um, but basically, we instantiate a client, right? Uh, we can kind of decide whether or not this is a sandbox request. So a sandbox meaning, uh, is this a real request or is this just like a fake uh, testing request? Um, and then in order to make a request, we have to give a latitude and longitude for that request. So you can't really send in addresses, uh, which is pretty annoying. So you have to geocode them yourself and then give them a lat and lon. Uh, and then you also have to choose what product you want. So I default to UberX because, you know, I mean, it works just fine. I don't need a black car to go everywhere. That's ridiculous, Travis Kalanick. Uh, but, you know, you could get an SUV or, you know, like uh, some other type of Uber if you wanted to. I just default to the, uh, the UberX. Um, so the product ID is equal to product choices two, which is Uber X in my city at least. Um, and then the ride is equal to this, which is the client request. So, uh, this actually makes a request to Uber, gives it the product ID, gives it the start latitude, start longitude and latitude and longitude. Uh, and then actually goes ahead, goes ahead and makes the request. So, uh, if you're interested in this Uber magic stuff, then I also have a, uh, a library on my GitHub that is Uber from the command line. So if you ever are kind of coding and you want to get yourself an Uber, you can do that and just type it in and type in your address and uh, you can make your developer friends jealous by not even taking out your phone to hell an Uber because that's the world we live in today. Uh, so that's Uber support um, and I just kind of put all of that in easily accessible methods so that within my actual application, I just call them. So let's see, get Uber method. So we first assemble the location data, which is all the latitude and longitude information. Uh, for uh, yeah, for the uh, for the um, origin and then the, also the destination and then it just hails the Uber uh, and says to so the user hailing your cab now. Check the Uber app for arrival information to cancel your trip. So, so really, uh, as far as what gets returned to the user, it's kind of up to you. Um, a lot of this stuff is up to you, but all that Amazon cares about in regards to this type of interaction with Alexa is the JSON back and forth and whether or not it's formatted correctly and uh, kind of what's inside of it. So. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, like I said, there's not really many fancy libraries right now to make this look really pretty, you know, so we're just kind of doing it in raw JSON, uh, and then adding methods as they come along. I imagine some of this stuff is going to be extracted out into something that's a lot more useful for Ruby developers, either by myself or somebody else. Um, but that's generally how uh, applications are composed. Uh, cool. Are there any final questions for me? Uh, this is kind of the end point of what I prepared. So any anything that any any has been kind of uh, nagging anyone in the back of their mind. I also don't care if you have a quote unquote stupid question because I won't think that it's stupid. I just want to answer them. So uh, if you've kind of been waiting this whole time and you're not sure, feel free to raise your hand. Anybody? Yeah. How do you define uh, your home location? There? How do you define your home location? Because like where to get uh, picked up? Uh, good question. So. Um, I actually have it hard coded in <laughs> oh. um, because it's a little bit hard with the way Alexa works to get a very accurate location for both. And I was getting very frustrated with that. So I was like, let me just get the destination for now. And later on, I'll get the origin. So that's actually an environment variable called default home location. Uh, and that's just set to a default for me. So there's actually also a default um, for landmarks. There's a default city. So when I say get me a cab to Union Square, it also adds to that string New York, New York, you know, and then. That way you know like what city you're in. It's easier for the geocoder. So, uh, any other questions in the crowd? Uh, right there. You can use an IP address to geocode, but really what it is is just uh, give me an address or an IP address or something else, and then translate it into a latitude and longitude or other location information. Yeah. Someone back there. So good question. So I wouldn't host it on my laptop <laughs> because yeah, as soon as I close it, it's, you know, it, yeah. in fact, I'll just do that right now. I mean, I'll turn off the application so you would get an idea of what would happen, you know, open Uber. There was a problem with the requested skills response. So you would get a lot of that basically. Um, but, you know, the developer answer is uh, scale up, right? So first of all, get a server, meaning a computer that doesn't get closed all the time um, and it is only used just for that. Um, so I might use AWS, like Amazon Web Services or Heroku or something else to host my application. 
Um, and then secondly, depending on the number of, of requests coming in, I might you know make the dyno size on Heroku bigger or smaller, make the amount of resources used bigger or smaller. So um, I think that you could probably have a pretty small instance and still serve a lot of people depending on what your application is doing. But uh, you're right. Like if a lot of people are using an application, it's just a million requests coming in at once and responses. And but that's why you have to have sessions to keep track of exactly like, oh, this is Zach's Uber request session, you know, or this is Sally's Uber request session, or else it's just impossible to know who you're dealing with, right? So, um, so yeah, I think that we're going to see more when this catches on a bit more. There's probably going to be more specific like Amazon Alexa hosting services that come up. But for now, you can just use any you know Linux box so that could be DigitalOcean or Heroku, etc. Yeah, does that answer your question? Great. Any other questions from the crowd? Yeah. Um, are there any like big advantages to using Alexa over like Siri and Cortana or like the other voice? Good question. Uh, I think there's a lot of advantages to using Alexa over them. Um, I think that Amazon is like really bullish about having this be like the winner right now. Uh, Siri has gotten some updates recently. Um, I definitely don't want to like trash talk any of them, but like. It took a long time for that to happen. Like, you know, people have wanted to create custom applications for Siri for so long, and it just took a competitor coming out with a product like that for them to realize they had to act, right? Um, so now they're playing catch up. Uh, and then Cortana, I don't even know. I mean, Apple guy here, right? So I don't really know what's going on with Cortana. Uh, I haven't heard amazing things, though. I think that the main like thing that Amazon has going for them with this is that they have hardware out there that has that is far superior to their competitors. Like. The Echo has seven microphones in it. I don't. I haven't seen a device of that yet. I think that when Google comes out with theirs, they're going to have something similar because they've realized that that's the big advantage is like having dedicated hardware rather than just being like everyone uses their phone microphone. So, um, and then I just think that they're thinking more about developers. So I was one of the first few people in the uh, developer preview of like the development environment and. Back then, it was not nearly as polished as it is now. It was a lot harder to get up and running. All the documentation was in Java, uh, but they've got teams of people now at Amazon who are entirely focused on getting the best experience to developers who are working on this platform, and they're willing, they're willing to work with people on what works best for them. So, um, yeah, I'm obviously a bit of a fanboy, but you know, I really do think that right now it's the best platform out there, um, and everyone else is just realizing, oh, well, great, this product caught on, time to also innovate, but. We kind of saw what happened with that, with the iPhone. You know, sales only last quarter finally went down, and it took about 10 years. So, you know, we'll see whether or not everyone can play catch up or not. Um, all right, cool. Well, thanks a lot for your time, everyone. It was great speaking with you. And uh, feel free to ask me questions up here if you'd like.